So um, we're continuing on our panel on negotiations and collaborations during and after a crisis. And our first speaker for that today is my uh, colleague and friend, Jessica Johnson, head of conservation for the Museum Conservation Institute at the Smithsonian Institution. And um, Jesse has been for many years uh, before coming back to the Smithsonian, you can read her bio in the back of the program, uh, has been with the uh, Iraqi Institute uh, for the uh, Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage. And she will talk about the case study of creating that uh, institution in study and negotiation and collaboration for project success. Jessica Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm told by Corey we have to keep on schedule, so I'm going to get um, get right into it. Um, thank you all for coming, and it's a great honor for me to be up here to represent a lot of colleagues that have been working on this project. Um, so, the Iraqi Institute for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage is an educational institution for heritage conservation located in Erbil, Iraq. And I've been asked to talk about how the Iraqi Institute can serve as a case study for understanding the role of collaboration in successful programs intended to help recover and preserve cultural heritage during and after disasters. The necessary collaborations take place at many different scales, but at core, it's a decision to work with diverse individuals who, who have all of their own reasons for supporting a project. The Iraqi Institute was developed explicitly to help get the heritage community in Iraq, which had been isolated from the international community because of, because of decades of sanctions and war, a sustainable way of developing this knowledge inside the country. The mission of the Iraqi Institute is to preserve the legacy of humanity contained in the unique cultural heritage of Iraq. It accomplishes this through um, through educating people in conservation and preservation and by inviting professionals from around the world to share expertise. The mission was defined in 2012 by the Advisory Council of the Iraqi Institute and it grew out of a simple idea, doing something besides short course training of, of Iraqi um, professionals in conservation and doing it in their own country. So this paper represents my own perspectives on, on what we've been doing. However, from the very beginning, the Iraqi Institute has been built on a collaboration of many individuals and institutions. The first idea for the programs at the Iraqi Institute came out of discussions in, in 2008 between, and before between individuals from the U.S. State Department, the Walters Art Gallery, Winterthur Museums and Ga Gardens, the University of Delaware Art Conservation Program, and the National Park Service. My colleague, Brian Leone, who's now the executive director of the Iraqi Institute, has shared all the experiences that I'm going to describe. Many others in Iraq and the U.S. have joined this de dedicated group of partners. Most of, him, most of us are still um, working and advising the Institute. However, because this presentation is being webcast and will remain on the web, I'm not going to be mentioning any of our individual colleagues in Iraq. However, I do want to point out um, a number of people here today who are working with us. The first two are members are, of our advisory council, um, doc, Dr. Nancy Odegaard from the University of Arizona and Terry Draymond Weiser, who recruited me to the project back in 2009. So the, the politics of Iraq is, is complicated. Um, and in order to understand some of, <laughs> yeah, in order, I'm, you know, of course not going to try to, to understand it, but I want to make clear some of the negotiations and successions, uh, successes we've had. Um, so you need to understand, um, for those of you who aren't following closely, some of the current political organization in Iraq that affects heritage. Iraq is a parliamentary government with a constitution uh, voted into place in 2005. At the same time, northern Iraq was officially partitioned out as the Kurdistan Autonomous Region with its own prime minister and parliament. Throughout the development of the Iraqi Institute, negotiations have taken place both with the central Iraqi government through the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and the Kurdistan Regional Government, um, which is um, through the Erbil Governor's Office. 
Archaeological heritage over about 100 years old is legally under the State, um, under the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, which I'm going to call Sabah from now on. Um, and that was um, that that um, legality was put into the Constitution. However, in Iraqi Kurdistan, um, heritage falls under the responsibility of the KRG Department of Antiquities. Other cultural heritage in the KRG and, and throughout the rest of Iraq, like folk life collections, historic architecture, libraries, manuscripts, archives, paint, paintings, falls under a variety of governmental ministries and agencies. So our original discussions for the Iraqi Institute um, were carried out between the Sabah and the U.S. State Department, which led to our focus on archaeological materials. However, despite our focus, all types of tangible cultural heritage have been addressed in a variety of programs held by us and others at the Iraqi Institute over the years. The Iraqi Institute began as part of the U.S. State Department's Iraq Cultural Heritage Project, or ICHIP. ICHIP was a much larger program, and the training component in Iraq was originally the smallest section of our project. And there was a question yesterday about what, what had gone on after the war in 2003. ICHIP was a big part of the um, U.S. government's response, and I can answer more specific questions after if people are interested. Um, Brian Leanne was hired as the project director and arrived in Erbil in February 2009, and I was hired and arrived in Erbil in May 2009. Through the assistance of the Erbil Re Regional Reconstruction Team, which was the pre precursor to the current U.S. Consulate in Erbil, a group of academic and political representatives from the U.S., Sabah, and the KRG met with the Kurdistan Prime Minister um, in February 2009 during a trip to set up the original training programs of ICHIP. The, that meeting and the negotiations resulted in the assignment of a building, which was the old public library in central Erbil, and the land it sits, uh, sits on and funding, funding for the renovations of this building. The KRG partnership was put under the responsibility of the Airbnb Governor's Office at this time, and the Airbnb Governor's Office continues responsibility for management and maintenance until now. So all of these early negotiations led to the current Iraqi Institute. Through the renovation and construction of a permanent home for our project, the ideals and the ideas developed for the educational programs became codified. Without this building, the project probably would have ended in uh, 2010, which was the end of the original funding. But this place, which was developed through those high-level negotiations and collaborations between Sabah, the KRG, and the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, the Airbnb RRT, and also the supporting expertise from academic advisors to the project, developed as a separate space made of the ideals and perspectives of all of these people. So in some ways, within Iraq, the Iraqi Institute is not seen as American or Kurdish or Arab. It's seen as something outside of all of those cultural, political, and ethnic boundaries, a place where those who want to preserve cultural heritage come together to learn and to share ideas. So at the end of 2010, a memorandum of understanding was negotiated by the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad between the Sabah and the Erbil Governor's Office for the ongoing management of the Institute. And that agreement um, forms the basis for the current structure for the Institute today. So there's a five-member um, Iraqi directory board. Three members are from Sabah and two members are from the KRG. The chair of that directory board, an archaeologist, was appointed by the KRG and has day-to-day -day responsibility for the management of the institute building and its use. He lives in town. It, it, it's um, um, a, pra a practical uh, responsibility as much as anything. And salaries for the staff of the institute, such as the librarian, uh, accountant, translators, cleaners, lab manager, are paid for by both the Sabah and the KRG. There's also an international advisory council made up of um, Iraqi advisors and international academic um, experts. The University of Delaware took over the management of the academic programs described here in 2011. So the Iraqi Institute building is a, a big building inside a walled compound that's near the Erbil Citadel. The, the vacated building was standing basically empty at the start of the project and the renovation was over, overseen by the Airbnb Governor's Office. The educational programs were always planned to be for students from all over Iraq, the entire country, so finding housing was an early part of discussions. 
And as the planning for the new building advanced, dormitory housing for both men and women was built into the plans. Dormitory housing was a way for the project to save on housing costs, but early on there was a realization that living and eating together could help us build the community of people who were, were, who were participating in our programs. Building plans included male and female areas with shared kitchens and common rooms so people staying at the institute can interact easily with each other 24 hours a day. This will be familiar to anyone who's come to visit us. Shared breaks and a daily lunch are built into the design of educational programs within the specific, with the specific intention of building a community of scholars and practitioners tied through their experiences at the Institute, including pizza that we have almost every day. When programs funded by different international agencies, and I'm going to talk more a little bit about them in a minute, the same breaks and lunch are part of all programs. And over time, we've also found that the regularly scheduled lunch is an easy way to invite numerous others in the heritage community who work in Erbil who are coming to do their own research or other um, conservation projects. Um, if they're visiting from Iraq or, or beyond, um, brings them all together at the same time, and this helps to bring, um, to build interactions with the larger heritage community. Since its, since its inception, three tracks of heritage preservation have been established and developed at the Iraqi Institute. Museum collections care and conservation, architectural conservation, and archeological site conservation, each managed by different program directors, and Catherine Hansen is our archeological site conservation program director. These programs were designed as long form educational programs. Institute courses were designed to bring the knowledge and understanding of Iraqi heritage preservation professionals up to international levels and to expand their professional contact with the international heritage community. And I should make clear that the people who are coming to our programs all work somehow in heritage. They work for the ministries or museums or um, in academia doing some sort of heritage already as part of their jobs. I'm going to use the Collections Care and Conservation Program as an example to describe our educational approach. However, the, however, the basic outline um, also applies to our other two programs. Programs are designed as modules of six to eight weeks divided into blocks of one to two weeks on specific topics. Usually each block is taught by a different visiting lecturer who's expert on a specific heritage conservation topic like ivory, metals, exhibit conservation. And in the audience today, we have a number of visiting lecturers, Evie Oler, Kathy Hawks, Sebastian Meyer, and also Barbara Moore, who's taught with us in the past. The first year for conservation students gave them a, a broad background in preventive conservation including understanding the agents of deterioration, how conservation fits into archaeological excavation, as well as exhibit planning and development. They develop improved skills for documentation, including photography and condition assessment. And they're given information on the technology, deterioration, and care of, collection, of the kinds of collections that they have in their museums, including archaeological stone, glass, metals, ivory, Islamic manus uh, manuscripts, uh, textiles, and human remains. And the materials that we were, were taught were defined through discussion with representatives from the Sabah early in the, in the program. From our first classes in 2009, we asked all visitors to provide us with a final report following a, following a simple standard format. This allows us to collect comparable information from all our teachers. These reports have been useful in, in several ways. First, they provide subsequent teachers in each course with real information on what the students have been taught, not what they were planning to taught, but what they were able to actually get through, and the issues that they might have had to, to further address um, depending on the students that they had. These reports also make it easier to evaluate individual student improvement when there's not a single teacher in each classroom at all times. This collaborative approach to sharing information on successful teaching methodology, methodologies and difficulties in the classroom um, ensured that the course is constantly adapted and involved to the specific needs of, of our students. So as I said, we've had a number of other programs at the Iraqi Institute uh, beginning in 2009, sponsored by a variety of international and academic agencies. 
Um, and the list of the programs is up on the slide. So in addition to bringing in a wider range of topics and approaches to researching and conserving heritage, it expanded the number of students interacting with, with each other and, and expanded the developing alumni network. It also gave students more opportunities to develop relationships with more international experts. The, the practical realities of heritage conservation are different in every country. There are international standards, ethical guidelines, gen general theoretical methodologies, and spe some specific materials that are broadly accepted. Um, we've talked about some of that here. But to be effective practitioners, heritage professionals need critical thinking and decision-making skills that allow them to make effective choices in their own communities and their own workplaces. For example, teaching students how to pack artifacts with polyethylene foam, because that's what we use here in America, when they can't purchase it in Iraq, does not help when they have to do recovery and storage of museum artifacts after a crisis. Teaching them that it's important to protect artifacts from abrasion and shock using materials that are chemically and physically stable allows individuals to make choices based on the materials available. So we, we imported and brought in a lot of high-end options and we showed them and used them, but we also gave students um, skills and techniques for how to evaluate the options that they had locally. We work with um, the, our heritage college colleagues in and around Iraq for more practical experiences. So here's an example where um, uh, students have worked on exhibit mounts for the Erbil Civilizations Museum, the local archaeological museum. And for other programs, we use the historic buildings in and around the citadel and archaeological sites within the citadel um, city limits. The courses are designed so that students work in Erbil for about six to eight weeks and then go back home and do a two to three week practical a practical project, a practicum, um, and that puts into use their new skills um, right away. This reinforces the learning, but it also helps to ensure that their managers let them use their new skills and information, and so begin to change the institutions as well. For most programs, the students are also enrolled in English language training with the goal of improving their language to better work with our international community. So sustainability, that's always then the issue. Um, a variety of initiatives have taken place since 2009 towards building long-term sustainability of the Iraqi Institute. In order to ensure that there was broad understanding of what we were trying to do in our educational goals, um, we've held several meetings inviting management and academics from all the provinces in Iraq alongside international heritage experts. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to describe them in detail. Um, but what this has ensured is that over time um, it's helped us to refine our goals and the mission and vision for the Institute, but it's also ensured that the institution send the proper students to their program. They understand what their, their staff is going to get out of our programs. As part of our overall strategy of long-term education and sustainability, a number of Iraqis who are designated master trainers are teaching students as well. These people work for both the Sabah and the KRG. Over time, they'll take over the management of the programs. With each course the master trainers partic participate in, they take on more of the preparation and the practical training, lectures, and mentoring for students. These master trainers are also sharing information through workshops and practical programs when we're not around. And all of them want to expand their knowledge through attending master's and PhD programs in Europe or the US. However, in reality, the difficulties of securing a position, funding, language, and a visa to attend university outside Iraq have limited the opportunities for all but one of our master trainers. The primary issue facing the sustainability of the Iraqi Institute, as in all of these projects we've been hearing about, is long-term sustainable funding. Generous support from numerous governments, institutions, and people have ensured development of an effective place for teaching and learning about heritage conservation. However, with the huge impact of ISIS since 2014, Iraqi governments currently have no funding to support the institute beyond staff salaries. In the Erbil governor, governorate alone, there are 600,000 um, Syrian refugees and IDPs, um, which is a huge drain on the resources of the governments. The Iraqi Institute Board of Directors instituted user fees for international programs using the Institute facilities in, in 2013. 
These fees are used for the maintenance of the institute facilities as well as hiring of additional staff needed when classes are on, like translators and more cleaners. Um, these fees allow the institute to continue running, but they're not currently enough for its long-term sustainability, so new models of funding must be defined over the next year years. Um, so through all of the programs at the Iraqi Institute, we've trained over 300 Iraqis who are um, all out there working in heritage conservation, and they've developed professional relationships in a network of professionals that transcends gender, language, age, ethnicity, politics, religion, and geography. Negotiation and collaboration have taken place at many different scales, whether it be between international governments, between governmental agencies within a country, between experts and advisors developing a shared vision for a program or an institution, between heritage experts with different approaches to teaching and carrying out conservation projects, and between people living and working together during the very practical aspects of a project. It takes a very thoughtful approach to understanding one's own goals, both personal and professional, and how they intersect with others' goals, be they governments, institutions, or individuals, to successfully negotiate a collaboration that will help to save cultural heritage and its importance to communities who have suffered crisis. So in August 2014, the archaeological site conservation program was canceled partway through and students and lecturers returned home due to threats to ISIS moving towards Erbil. And for 10 months, no courses were held at the Iraqi Institute. However, in June and August 2015, a course in emergency preparedness and, and disaster recovery was taught for about 18 students. The program, which was sponsored by the University of Pennsylvania Cultural Heritage Center as part of its Safeguarding Heritage of Syria and Iraq partnership with the Smithsonian and the AAAS, um, uh, was, a, was a great success, and the program was also supported um, with teachers and um, uh, information, uh, curriculum information from ECROM. And I'm very, very happy to say that just last week, the Smithsonian was granted funded from the, funding from the State Department for a new long-form program to be carried out in partnership with the University of Delaware. And I thank all of my Smithsonian colleagues who had so much um, to get that going so quickly and um, with so much support over the last year. So finally, I'd, I'd like to thank the numerous colleagues in the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and the Kurdistan Regional Government who've supported the Iraqi Institute and its development since 2008 through continu continuous political turmoil and upheaval. Despite unimaginable, unimaginable personal and professional difficulties, they continue working constantly for the preservation of their heritage, and it's a great honor to work with them. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Kim Rice, the director of the Museum Studies Program um, at GW. And I, I want to start by um, commending Jessica Johnson and her colleagues at the Iraqi Institute for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage on their really inspirational work. Um, you know, as you've heard and, if, and read, um, the founding staff, um, which includes Iraqi participants and partners, has persisted over a number of years, um, both in creating a viable program and then in keeping it operational despite significant uh, political, cultural, and budgetary challenges. And Jesse is very modest. Um, although many people have been involved, um, Jesse and her colleague, um, Brian Leone have been the boots on the ground, um, and they deserve a lot of credit for creating and sustaining this model, um, which Jesse describes in her paper as a capacity building redevelopment project. So I, maybe this seems kind of corny, but I just want to applaud you for what you've done, because this work is not easy. Um, so. I've just, I have just a few remarks to make, um, and then hopefully we can open the floor up to questions. Um, I think we should think of advanced training in museum methods as one of the best ways to build capacity um, and give us a leg up, so to speak, when faced with um, cultural heritage that is in peril, 
whether through war or environmental issues. In addition to in-country programs like the Iraqi Institute, um, which is frankly a rare example, another viable way that international staff development through professional training can occur is by means of exchange and residency programs held in the US, typically sponsored by the government and or nonprofit organizations and held in universities or museums. And like the Iraqi Institute, um, these programs are aimed at museum and cultural heritage professionals from under-resourced and sometimes war-torn countries. And the training focuses on developing practical skills. By exporting our best educational practices to a world stage, these programs can help establish the continuing relevance of what we have learned here over more than 50 years of developing specialized training um, on many fronts for US museum workers. My personal involvement in this area um, includes directing um, a US State Department museum residency program for 24 Iraqis held at my university in 2012. I'm not going to show you any pictures from the project for the same reasons that Jesse um, expressed. Um, many of the people who were part of my project have had, um, have had some very bad things happen to them from ISIL. So no pictures. Um, my other experience is as a museum studies professor working over the years with international students from Middle Eastern countries and elsewhere who are working towards graduate degrees. And I've, not surprisingly um, to everybody in this room, you know, I've discovered that true cross-cultural training is very challenging. Um, and not only because museums everywhere are complex and varied organizations, but because in many countries outside the US, museums hold different orders of relevancy and authority than they do here. So the downside of the residency programs is that they rely almost completely on the participants to implement back home what they've learned. And for many reasons that you might imagine, that's very hard for them to do. Um, as you've heard today, the Iraqi Institute, on the other hand, continues to provide mentorship for their graduates, and ideally, some of them go on to become master trainers and directly pass on what they've learned to others in country. Nevertheless, I, I can argue, or I would argue, that participants in residency programs do derive tangible rewards from direct exposure to museums and their methods outside of their home countries. But yet, sometimes these, method, these benefits are different from what um, we might have predicted initially. Well, our Iraqi participants were stunned, really, um, not just by our museums, but by the degree of racial and religious diversity in the US, the integration of women into the highest levels of our, of our society, and very envious um, of the ease with which most of us live our lives. Um, a life without fear, as one of them wistfully described it. For example, we visited the Holocaust Museum during the time that they were here in DC. And you know, many Iraqis have been educated to believe that the Holocaust is not true. So they were very skeptical, skeptical about going, going there. Um, and after we finished the exhibitions, I'm not sure that many of them had changed their minds. But an old man approached our group, and he was a survivor. And when he described what had happened to his family, he had seen his parents, his sister, shot by the Nazis in front of him. He'd spent two years in a concentration camp. He'd escaped, and he'd survived by eating the bark of trees in the forest. They were partially convinced. Um, and these are things that you can't teach anybody in a PowerPoint. Um, you, you need to be there and to have that give and take. Um, participants in our program were male and female. They were Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. 
Um, and while they didn't get along perfectly, and there were some tense moments during the course of our um, program, they mostly cooperated in a friendly manner, and they came together at night over those communal meals that Jesse described um, also happening at the Iraqi Institute. So I think what, where, regardless of where the training happens, whether it's in the US or with US sponsorship abroad, these programs are going to be very influential and important if they can be sustained and funded um, in helping to shape a engaged global museum community in the future. So any questions for Jesse? If, if I could just add one more thing. Um, our director of the Iraqi Institute attended one of Kim's programs here. And he came back changed, and, he, and I think one of the reasons the Institute has been successful is he, he understands what we're trying to do. So, um, so it was this, um, uh, the, the two kinds of education together are, um, are supporting each other. We shouldn't think of them as, as separate things. Stephanie Hornbeck, thank you so much, Jesse, for your talk this morning. I really enjoyed, I've been taking copious notes from your paper as well. I feel that the Cultural Conservation Center in Haiti has much to learn from what you've developed in Erbil and want to just say, I appreciate the challenges that you've described and really look forward to working with you and exchanging ideas even though our regional center is in the, a tropical Caribbean climate, it's an island, I feel there's much we can learn from what you've done in Erbil, so thanks so much. I also wanted, wanted to say that um, um, we've talked about our successes, but for those of us that continue to work in educating in, in projects like this, I think we need to think about other um, areas that may bring in new ideas to, to us as well. Um, I want to look more into adult education and, and using adult education in uh, techniques in what we're doing and also looking into the role of education in, in surviving trauma and, and how that may be affecting uh, what we're able to get across to our students and thinking about those things more deeply. So for, for these educational programs, it's not just teaching about the culture, it's understanding, understanding them when, understanding them within a much bigger context. Uh, Terry Weiser. Um, wonderful presentation, Jesse, as usual. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the idea of sustainability. And uh, you mentioned um, sort of financial sustainability, which is, of course, always a huge challenge. Uh, but there are other forms of sustainability in, that I think have been already very successful uh, through this project. And just a couple of really small examples, but I think are very meaningful. The students who have been through the program uh, have created networks of um, contacts through the, uh, the people who have come to instruct or uh, have been through the institute. And, and Jesse, you alluded to that already, but I know, for example, that I get uh, Facebook comments from my students on a regular basis, almost every day there's something on Facebook. Um, and, and the other, um, uh, I think, form of sustainability has been, so for example, we were talking just the other day about uh, one of the previous students who works in one of the local museums in Erbil, and um, we were invited to see what he had gone back and accomplished there, and um, we were greeted by the director of the museum and by the student, uh, and he was showing off to us the entire rehousing of the collection. But again, as Jesse pointed out, not necessarily done with what we would use, but with what was available and affordable to them. But there was a great deal of pride on the part of the student and huge support by the director of the museum for what had been accomplished. Mm -hmm. 
The center seems like a great model. Is there any plan on duplicating this um, either in other countries or regionally? Well, that, I guess that depends on the crises <laughs> that happen. Um, one thing um, I've already been talking with um, Stephanie about is trying to do a, an article, article that, co that compares the two institutions, looking for commonalities that we think um, were, made it successful and, and, and other ideas to try to put this down. So the next time the opportunity comes up, um, that it's you know it's written down in a in a very a more comprehensive and um, sort of step by step I guess kind of uh, map towards doing this. Okay, one more question. Uh, hi, uh, I was one. Oh, oh, someone else was talking. Was it only me? <laughs> <laughs> Two mics. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I just, you know, want to uh, say as much as uh, I, you know, um, admire um, the experience of the uh, Iraqi Institute and that effort on the educational level, I just want to raise a question for everybody um, about um, the loss of heritage in Iraq in general and uh, efforts uh, to preserve heritage in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and as much as uh, we're talking, uh, you know, neutrally about heritage. Uh, how much can we really move forward without bringing the political discussion into preserving heritage? Um, I mean, particularly what Aparna was saying, you know, this thing we talk about connecting people with their heritage and identity, um, but the whole, um, you know, question of where people stand politically, how do they see heritage within the political context, uh, I think these are very important issues to, um, to raise, either in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in uh, Syria. Um, so uh, again, I mean, with now ISIS in northern Iraq, with the efforts of the Iraqi government, uh, where to my knowledge, there's no effort whatsoever has been done in actually planning even uh, with the, with the fights that are going on in northern Iraq, with the advances and losses that the you know, Iraqi army, that uh, the Hashd militia are doing, um, there are no talks about preservation of heritage. Um, thank you. Well, I, I can say with our new program going on, we'll be working with our Sabah colleagues and, and their staff that they'll be sending to our program to work towards this. And I think the course that was held in, in June and August was a, a start towards that, but not on the national level, just at a personal level of getting the individuals ready when they can. We've, we have students who still officially work for the Mosul Museum when they can go back to be ready to go back for recovery. So. Um, um, it's, it's started, I think, in Iraq, but um, now that we're going back, we'll be able to support that even more. <laughs> no, uh, on the picture shows, you know, uh, each table had a film extra extractor, and how did you able to transport all the equipment and supplies? It, uh, all of the things that are sort of international quality um, uh, were transported through Istanbul, mostly through um, one particular conservation company that's in Istanbul. Um, a lot of things, though, were locally were locally sourced through things like restaurant supply and um, hospital supply. And the other thing is the teaching by English. Uh, what the uh, length of time? I mean, do they? Uh, had some knowledge of English to begin with it, or? 
That, that just depend, depends on the individual. Some come with quite a lot of English and some have, have nothing. I didn't say it's actually all our classes are taught in English, but they're translated into Kurdish and into Arabic because of some of our younger students um, uh, do not speak, um, some of our younger Kurdish students do not speak really good Arabic because of the no-fly zone that was put into place. So, um, so we're actually working in three languages at all times. Another reason we're making everybody t speak English. So, so within the institute, we get better at better at understanding each other.